Uh, just a quick overview. So I'll, I'll kick off here with a brief introduction of InterTrust for those on the call that aren't familiar with us, some of our background and, and uh, motivations. And then I'll give a quick summary of the InterTrust platform and what our motivations are for developing that software. And after that, I'll jump into the EV infrastructure use case, some of the challenges that we're seeing in adoption and, and planning of EV infrastructure. Uh, and then I'll give an overview of our clean grid toolkits and hand off to my colleague, Sun Chun, who will demonstrate that. And then we'll hand it over to Tobias, who will uh, share a bit about Invilio, uh, what they're doing, an overview of their company and a demonstration of their software as well. So let me begin with an introduction of InterTrust. We are a privately held company uh, with a headquarters in Silicon Valley. So we're based here in California, but we do have offices in Europe and Asia. Our expertise is in security and privacy and providing trust for open networks and service enabled devices. Some of our key technologies and inventions are trusted distributed computing, digital rights management, which uh, is really a cornerstone around app, app stores. Uh, we've been very active in the media space around securing uh, media content, whether it be movies or music, the digital rights management intellectual property that InterTrust developed over 30 years ago has been a, a really key cornerstone in enabling those studios and um, content owners to distribute their data securely throughout the world, whether it be over um, cable services with set-top boxes or even now obviously online through different streaming services. Uh, so secure interoperability and these trusted services for the connected world, that's really what InterTrust is focused on. Uh, we have a comprehensive IP portfolio. We have a top research lab with top scientists, including a Turing Prize recipient. Currently, we're very active in a number of different verticals and markets, uh, including energy, IoT, automotive, media, as I mentioned, uh, consumer electronics. A lot of that DRM technology is actually embedded in televisions and other hardware devices where media is being played. Um, healthcare and, and others. And we have a world-class team uh, with an extensive track record in a number of these different verticals. So looking at today's IT landscape and thinking about this trusted, trusted uh, interoperability for connected services, really what InterTrust and what we're focused on and looking at, these landscapes are becoming increasingly complex. You have a number of different sources of data, you have IoT devices, which reside on the edge, they're producing data, you have cloud infrastructure, whether it be Azure or Amazon, IBM, Ali Cloud, uh, all of these different cloud-based technologies <clears throat> where and infrastructure providers where data is now being stored, they're using a number of different storage technologies. So it may be a data warehouse, it may be some relational databases, you may be using Hadoop, big data storage, you may be having some uh, flat files on an object store like CSV. Um, so we're seeing a lot of diverse architecture. It's this disparate data storages, competing cloud infrastructure. And this is a very, very difficult landscape to manage. And if you're looking at providing interoperability or data moving throughout this landscape, it really presents a number of challenges. There's really no interoperability. It's difficult to provide consistent security. This exposes you to different um, things like data breaches, data leaking out of this system. It can be expensive to integrate all of these different systems and tie them together. You have a lot of bespoke projects um, because honestly, a lot of these services are deployed for a specific purpose. Um, so you have software that's fit for one purpose, but then when you want a horizontal view across your organization, tying together all of these disparate technologies can be very, very challenging. And that provides a landscape where it's impossible to govern that data or provide compliance. And so with the InterTrust platform and really the core of the product that we've been working on here at InterTrust, we want to provide this trusted data interoperability between these different multi-party systems. So you can think of the InterTrust platform as a middleware that can reside and provide interoperability across all of these different data sources between items that are producing data or storing data and consumers that are using data, whether it be an application, whether that be a data scientist, whether that be a business analyst working in Tableau, we want to allow you to govern your data wherever it may reside, provide that interoperability, not only within your own organization, but with potentially 
external stakeholders, whether it be partners or other service providers that might bring things like machine learning to your organization to add value to that big data value chain um, and really start to tie all of that together. And so that's the crux and, and, and the problems and that data friction is really what the InterTrust platform is looking to help organizations deal with um, at, a, at a very horizontal level. Now, when we start to look and apply this technology into specific verticals like EV adoption, <clears throat> let's take a look and dive into what's, what we see happening here. So using the city of San Francisco as an example, we see EV adoption is accelerating and this is being driven by a number of factors but in San Francisco, one of the main goals is these climate initiatives that they've established. So clean air, reducing pollution, promoting electrification of mobility. And they have set a very aggressive target of having 100% EV sales by 2030. So what does this mean? This is going to be a rapid increase of the number of EV vehicles that are on the roads, looking at taking a number of 20,000 vehicles uh, as of 2020 and growing that around 18 times more to close to 400,000 uh, within the next 30 years. So that's a huge explosion, a very aggressive target. Um, what will this mean? This means we need additional infrastructure to support all of these vehicles that will be moving around the city. Uh, one of the biggest barriers for EV adoption is limited driving range, uh, driver anxiety around finding a charging station. These charging stations aren't ubiquitous right now. Um, so how can you deploy this uh, charging infrastructure so that we can satisfy the need? And the estimate here is that within six times, we're going to need six times more charging in 2030 from what was installed in 2019. So again, a very aggressive target. This is one of the most, if not the most aggressive target within the U.S. Um, and this will require substantial charging infrastructure. And all there are additional cities just looking within the U.S. I mean, the Euro European market is also very much a leader in some of this. China is leading EV adoption, but within the US market, you know, we see other cities like Houston, Memphis, Seattle, Sacramento, they're all implementing similar climate targets, similar EV goals. So this is not a problem that will be unique to San Francisco, but they are definitely leading the charge in terms of um, the, this aggressive stance on rolling out EV adoption. So what's required to get this infrastructure in place? Well, this planning will require data and kind of getting back to that original value proposition of the InterTrust platform, this is a multi-party data problem. You're gonna have a variety of, infra uh, of data owners, a variety of stakeholders who hold bits of this data. And that could include things like people like city agencies, so the DMV within the city may have vehicle registration data. Uh, utilities, they'll have all of the infrastructure data. Where are these substations? What type of low voltage lines, high, high voltage lines reside in the city? Uh, what is the capacity of those lines? You have charging system operators who are running existing charging stations. So you have, what are the loads on these uh, particular charging stations? You have vehicle manufacturers and we're seeing a lot more interest in vehicle telematics. Uh, as cars become smarter, start to communicate more with the OEMs, you can understand what the battery state is, what the vehicle location is. Um, and that is actually very sensitive data. This is personally identifiable information possibly. So there's um, data regulations like CCPA that might be subject uh, to some of these data. And then just EV owners themselves, they might provide some insights about where they would like to see charging poles deployed and commercial data vendors that might bring sort of uh, complementary data sets to the fold that might be useful. Um, this might include, you know, aggregate telematics data across all OEMs, for example, traffic patterns, for example. Um, it's important to also realize that this is not a static situation. This is a very dynamic situation. Cities are gonna need to re-examine this and adapt as these, challenge, as these conditions change. And so they're going to need ongoing access to this data. It isn't as if a single data dump will be sufficient. Being able to provide agile access to this data uh, will really enable them to optimize their planning and be efficient with that. Um, and so access to data on the grid power availability, land availability, the current location and usage of the charging infrastructure, this is often an obstacle for decision-making. So we see this as a data friction point. It's very difficult to access these bits of data. And that may be due to a number of different reasons. 
There may be competitive risk. There may be supply chain risk where some of these data owners don't want to provide this data. There may be privacy concerns. And so all of this, again, introduces data friction. And that's really where the Intertrust platform and our clean grid, clean grid toolkit is looking to remove some of that data friction. So what are the results of all this data friction? Well, we see poor communication and data gaps. And what does this do? It significantly increases some of the soft costs around rolling out EV infrastructure. And so the procurement and the requirements, typically those are very known uh, costs for the charging system operators or people looking to deploy this infrastructure. But what's happening is they're running into issues around understanding the available capacity at a prospective site. And as a result, they either have to explore multiple sites at once, which really expands and multiplies the potential for soft costs because they have to you know, put, many, um, put many potential sites out there when eventually they're gonna select one or two of those. And so it's additional cost to plan, uh, go through these processes, try to identify what sites are viable and it impacts the overall cost. So in the worst case, what we're seeing here is a significant amount of time is being spent in order to identify uh, viable sites. And this is mostly due to the communications between the utilities and the charging system operators or the EV supplier providers who are looking to deploy this infrastructure. And so again, if we can streamline a lot of this data flow and the data supply chain, eliminate some of this data friction that's causing this poor communication, we think we can add significant value, speed up the time to deployment and make it much easier to get this infrastructure in place. And so that leads me to the Intertrust Clean Grid, which is this digital toolkit for the clean energy economy that we've worked on here at Intertrust and Sung and his team have been very active in de developing uh, this software. And what it does is it really leverages the core features of the Intertrust platform. It provides data governance. We have a backend that could provide time series data storage. We have our own time series database that's very cost efficient and performant. We can provide data virtualization to go out and connect to data sources where they reside. This doesn't require migrating all your data to a central repository. And we can allow you to start to distribute this data and work with service providers uh, who might need to get access to this or to distribute it to other people who are interested in evaluating that data using it in analysis. So these packages, <clears throat> they have these applications, they're designed to help these utilities meet their goals uh, of the clean energy transition. It's suitable for EV, grid and retail data operations where data is going to be shared with multiple different stakeholders. And also the toolkit provides the ability to not only use the tools that we, we have developed, but also to use APIs and some of the, the core service APIs to come together and develop your own uh, solutions on top of the platform. So it's really, again, allowing you to take advantage of all that data that's connected and start to build new solutions on top of it uh, using your own software that might be fit for purpose for your needs. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Sun Chun, and he'll give a demo of the Clean Grid solution. Cool, thanks, Chris. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so this is the quick demonstration of a, one of the applications that we have. This is a part of the Clean Grid Toolkit. And basically this is a visualization tool, planning tool for utilities, municipalities, and other planning organizations where they can combine uh, data that are owned by different uh, parties and be able to generate new insights based on that data access. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind is we don't, we don't provide the data, but we rather provide a tool or this tool that allows you stakeholders to share their data through, through this uh, platform. Uh, so the data can remain where it resides. We don't have to copy that data over to our platform. Um, and Another, another point here is this is a GIS system. So many people get confused. Uh, this is, we ourselves, we do use GIS, but the main focus here is more on the data aspect on the data side of things. So what we could do here is, uh, so we're looking at uh, the Silicon Valley area. So what we could do is we, we have some access to a variety of different types of data points. Uh, so you can see each of these, these layers of data. Some of this data is coming from publicly available, you know, just, out, just on the web. You could kind of download and integrate this data. So we have some of the EV charging data throughout the state of California. 
Uh, we also have some of the electric substation and power plants throughout the state. And then also some of the high voltage lines that goes throughout. Uh, the other data point that we have here, let me zoom into the city of San Francisco. Uh, so again, we also have some of the utility data. So this is a PG&E low capacity lines uh, that goes throughout the city of San Francisco. With this, you could identify how much load can be applied to each of these, uh, each of these uh, utility lines. Uh, we also have the PV hosting capacity lines. Uh, so again, how much energy can be hosted, how much uh, solar energy can be hosted in these in individual lines. And then finally, how much uh, feeder level distribution generations are actually being produced on these lines. So again, this is coming from the utilities. Uh, another data point that we have here is more around the municipalities. So you might have some data points coming from the, from the city themselves. So for example, here we have the parking structures, or parking garages throughout the city. Uh, we also have the individual uh, garages from households and homeowners. And finally, we also, in this demonstration, we have some third-party demographic data. So this is coming from another company. Uh, they, they might be an um, AI company. It could be a you know, data provider company. Anybody that has some uh, consumer consumption data uh, that we could integrate into the platform here as well. Now, one of the main features of the platform here is the ability to combine different types of data um, and so one of the use cases that we've addressed here in San Francisco or looking at in San Francisco is uh, recently, about a year ago, there was a mandate where uh, all of the parking structures throughout the city would need to convert 10% of their parking stalls to EV charging stalls. So if you think about it, one of the daunting tasks that the city had was how can they work with these uh, parking structure owners and identify which ones can install uh, the additional load. So if we combine that data along with the PG&E load capacity, one of the one of the use cases we have here is the ability for identifying which of these uh, parking structures can easily uh, support additional load on the grid without any infrastructure upgrades. So they could plan out and tear out. So initially, first phase, you could target these set of uh, parking garages. Second phase, they could uh, work with PG&E to uh, upgrade the infrastructure to help uh, support the additional load. Um, so right now, this is more of a visual tool, but the underlying data, you could also do some calculations on the raw data. So again, each of these parking owners can calculate how much load they expect. And using the information that's provided by PG&E, we could potentially give a rough estimate on which ones can support and can't support currently. Uh, another use case that's commonly used by the utilities and uh, the cities are more around um, parking garages. Now, if you think about it, as more people start uh, adopting electric vehicles, you know, majority of them will be likely charging their vehicles at home. So each of these garages will again likely have some sort of a charging station installed, and then what will happen? You know, again from the from the utilities and and the municipality perspective, what's going to happen when every one of these households decides to eventually buy an electric vehicle, and what effect would it have on the local grid? So again, this is another use case where the utilities and the the planning uh, side of the municipality can predict what will happen in the future and then potentially proactively introduce some sort of program, whether it be um, introducing some storage or maybe uh, upgrading the infrastructure or maybe introducing some sort of a program where they have a scheduled offset and when you can charge your vehicle. And the last piece of this demonstration um, is more focused around installing EV charging stations. So for the most part, so this, these are the existing charging stations, these green dots you see here. Um, for the most part, you know, most of the utilities and, and the cities, they, they install these charging, charging stations typically around, you know, the, the parking lots or maybe shopping malls or maybe next to a freeway. But beyond that, they, have, they really don't have a lot of information on where they can install these uh, or where they should install these EV charging stations. And so that's where we're working with uh, EV manufacturers and, and potentially we get access to some of their data um, and share that information with, uh, with the people that need that, that data. So for example, in this use case, um, if we knew you know, where majority of these electric vehicles are parking in conjunction with the map of existing charging uh, stations, 
we could identify where there's uh, areas where there's a uh, lack of uh, uh, EV infrastructure to support the needs by the uh, growing demand from the EV owners. So again, this is another, another data point that we could, we could collect and provide again to either the um, uh, EV um, installers or the municipalities or even to the utilities. Another use case we're looking at here is if we could look at the DMV registration, um, if we could identify uh, these heat maps of where these vehicles are being registered, electric vehicles, and in conjunction overlay that with the existing infrastructure and then plan out where there might be kind of gaps in the, in the map where we need to install more charging stations based on the, uh, the registration of these electric vehicles. And another use case we have here is more around data consumption or data um, where, where the end users can, can, can provide data. So potentially we could expose this application to your residents of your city. And then you could go and ask the, the EV owners themselves, hey, where would you like to install these charging stations? Uh, so an individual user could come in here, they could add a drop a pin on the map, uh, provide some details, Again, this is a way for utilities and, and municipalities to collect the, uh, information on behalf of their users. And so the multiple users can potentially like that same location. And now you're kind of crowdsourcing this information based on the behavior from your residents. Um, all this information can be, again, be controlled and governed and then shared with the appropriate uh, stakeholders so that we could help adopt uh, and install these uh, charging stations. So this is a good segue. Um, so now we've had, we have all the data, we have the grid data, we, have, we know where we want to install these charging points. But the next step is how viable or how likely is that location to install, to be able to handle the extra load. And so now I'll uh, transition this off to Tobias and we can talk a little bit more about the Embilio solution that's part of the uh, Clean Grid Toolkit that kind of showcases the, the next step in this process. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Sam. Also, thank you, Chris, for your presentation and the introduction. So let me also briefly share my screen um, at this point. Um, so I would also start with a short presentation of who we are as a company and then dive into a, a brief demo also of our solution. But maybe beginning of uh, a short story about Invelio. So as I have mentioned before, I'm the uh, global VP sales and marketing for Invelio. We are based in Cologne in Germany, and we are a software company that has developed one concrete product, which is called the Intelligent Grid Platform. And this product um, is used by distribution grid operators and utilities to uh, digitize and automate um, typical grid planning processes. So it's all about a fast and efficient integration, either of distributed energy resources like solar PV units, for instance, or new loads like EV chargers, as Sung just pointed out, into the grid. And um, maybe also to talk a bit about the current challenges that we see at the different grid operators. Actually, this reminds me pretty much also of the story that Chris pointed out in the very beginning. So this very disparate IT landscape that we also see at the different utilities. So you would find a range of different legacy systems that contain grid data or grid relevant data. So for example, a geoinformation system, for example, an ERP system, metadata management, um, all kinds of different tools that are used to include or, or manage all kinds of technical data around the grid. However, what we typically see is that um, there are no standardized or automate, uh, automated interfaces that can be used um, to, um, um, to combine and collect all these different data. And what that means is basically that in a typical use case of a grid planner, that is much manual data or a data preparation, data cleansing required. So collecting the data out of the different system uh, systems, bringing it together uh, to complete grid model and um, then performing the calculations, simulations, analyses, and so on on top of that. And this of course wouldn't be a problem if we are talking about um, processes that have to be carried out a couple of times per month. Um, but as uh, we have also seen before, we are now talking about mass processes. So for example, when it comes to the grid integration of EV chargers, um, all these chargers have to be evaluated. The impact on the grid has to be evaluated. And this is becoming a mass process that has to be performed hundreds and thousands of times uh, per month. 
And um, if we have a closer look at this particular uh, process, um, how this is performed uh, for a typical grid operator, uh, this is pointed out on this slide. And typically you would see a range of different systems that is used for this process. So by average, it would be two to let's say four or five different tools uh, that are, are used between the uh, incoming application from a customer to the completion and the feedback um, towards the customer. And um, as I've pointed out before, typically you would find um, um, lots of manual input required to combine data, to perform different steps during the solution finding process. And by average, we see a couple of hours that are needed per application as um, workload for a grid planner. And as this is uh, yeah, potentially a very big bottleneck uh, during the future rollout of additional EV charging infrastructure, um, that was our reason to develop the intelligent grid platform. So the software tool um, that we are offering to distribution grid operators. And this intelligent grid platform is basically some kind of completely new generation of smart grid software, because the main difference to the existing tools is that we provide a complete digital twin of the entire grid, always up to date within our platform, so that there is no need to combine data before you can kick off a simulation or analysis. Um, and on top of that, we have created a range of different applications and tools that can be used to streamline different processes, especially technical processes at the grid operator. So we're talking about this interconnection process. We are talking about future grid planning. For these purposes, we are providing these applications which are able to accelerate existing processes by the factor of 20 roughly. So you would not need a couple of hours uh, to evaluate the impact um, of a new generator or new load on the grid to plan grid reinforcement and grid upgrades and so on, but rather a couple of minutes. And um, obviously, as a result of that, um, there are also potentially tremendous cost save, uh, savings possible for the utilities and, uh, and the grid operators. Um, but how is this uh, possible? Uh, so to, the key to that is actually the grid hub. Uh, that's basically a database that contains uh, a complete digital twin of the entire grid uh, of the entire grid within our platform. And this data model or database is fed by a couple of different systems typically at the at the grid operators like the GIS, like an ERP system, or also by potential other tools like the Intertrust platform, for example, that can add additional valuable, uh, valuable data that can be used and also for grid planning purposes. And then on top of this grid hub, we have developed different applications that you can see in the upper right corner. Um, and each application has typically a dedicated use case and um, uh, supports one concrete um, process at, uh, at a grid operator. So for example, future grid planning, for example, the interconnection process. And the idea is, as I've mentioned before, to streamline these processes and uh, support the grid operators in the integration of EV charges into their grid um, and so on. But um, that would only be maybe a short introduction into our tool, into our company. And now I would also dive into a quick demo so that you can get a better overview of what this platform is doing um, in detail and how uh, this supports uh, or can support grid operators. So um, as you can see um, here, it's a browser-based platform. Um, so um, it's a server client-based setup. So we have centralized server capacities that contain all the data. And then the user just logs in, in, in the browser with his personal, personal credentials. And then what you can see here on the left-hand side is a news feed where, for example, information is shown when calculations are finished. Uh, for example, or when there was a data update. And on the right hand side, you will find shortcuts to all kinds of different applications that we have within our platform. Um, and due to the time restrictions in this webinar, I would focus on uh, two different use cases, um, picking up also what, what Sung demonstrated in, in his brief demo. And that would be first this idea of well, private residents are um, um, or having preferences about location for uh, EV chargers. 
And um, we would provide a tool that can check then also the technical feasibility with regard to the remaining grid capacities. And for that purpose, we have created a tool which is called the online connection check. And this is basically a smaller segment of our entire platform that can be integrated, for example, into a grid operators or utilities website. And the main purpose of this tool is that um, um, private residents, for example, can pick a, uh, a position on the map um, and check the technical feasibility of a, um, of a EV charger if there is enough remaining capacity there in the grid. And um, maybe let me quickly check for a, an address that I have checked out before. That is a good demonstration case. That would be an address in Santa Barbara in California. And um, when I now move back here and pick this address, you will see that you will zoom in in the map with this dedicated uh, address here, residential area in, in California. And then the user could pick a certain element, uh, for example, a solar PV unit, but also a charging station and check the technical feasibility um, at this location in the grid. So for example, you could put in here a capacity. First example could be a small wall box uh, with 11 kilowatts. And now you could submit, submit an application. And in the background, basically a power flow simulation is performed to check if there is enough remaining capacity in the grid. And as you can see now, there is direct feedback to the customer with all kinds of different potential information. So for example, the distance to a grid connection point uh, that is feasible, but maybe also some information about potential costs or remaining grid capacities at this location. So the main idea would be to provide uh, a customer with um, initial information about remaining capacities in the grid with a much higher level of detail compared to, for example, to a hosting capacity map so that this information can be used for the decision making for decision making before a binding application is filed to the DSO. Um, so that would be then the part of our platform that can be opened up to the public. Um, but the, the main part of our platform is then more used by the grid planners um, at a utility or, or, or distribution grid operator. And um, then I would also now switch somehow sides and show you what on, on their end can be done with the platform. So maybe with the same example. So this charging station that has to be evaluated to see if the raining, uh, raining grid capacities uh, are sufficient um, to integrate a new device into the grid. And for that purpose, we have also one application uh, which is called connection request that basically um, supports this entire customer journey uh, from filing the application to the technical grid study and also providing feedback to the customer. Um, again, I have prepared one, one application before this, uh, this webinar. So here in the overview, you can see basically again, same location here in, uh, in Santa Barbara, 11 kilowatt private charging station. So same example that I have used before. But with the main difference that now, as you are in the internal view of the grid operator, you have um, much more information available. So you can see, for example, here, um, the, the entire grid with uh, the low voltage feeders as one example. But when you go to a different tab, you can also uh, get much more information about the calculation results. So that is what you can see here on the left-hand side. So what's the impact on voltage levels in the grid? So what's the impact on line utilization? So typically all the information that are needed for grid planet to decide if a new device can be integrated into the grid without problems or if uh, line upgrades or transform upgrades are required. Um, but maybe also to show you a different examples where the grid will face um, yeah, technical limits and, and the results of that. Um, I would quickly uh, change the installed capacity here and, and go for a, a much larger um, a charging station with um, 50 uh, kilowatts and then start the process again. So what's now done basically in the background, again, a power flow calculation is started to evaluate the technical impact of this larger 
uh, charging station on the grid, the impact on the lines will be evaluated, the impact on all the, the nodes and transformers will be evaluated and also compared to the technical limits um, of this grid. And now you can see here in the upper right corner, there was an, a notification that the calculation was finished. And then when I move back here into the results, you will see that I can see here a red flag and also here clearly marked that the line is overutilized. So um, above the limit, so that here a, a grid upgrade would be needed to integrate a larger charging station into the grid. Um, if required, you can also jump here into a uh, detailed result view where you can then also evaluate uh, the impact um, on the lines and, and the nodes in the grid in more detail. So for example, you will find over here then um, the, new, the new load, the new generator, so the EV charging station with 50 kilowatts. And here you will find the last segment of this feeder uh, has a utilization of above 100%. Um, because basically the cross section is is not not, not big enough, uh, and we provide all kinds of different tools, tables, charts, and and so on, um, filters that can be used to dive deeper into to, into the results here. But I would skip that part and maybe move back to show you also some some um, yeah steps for solution finding because now obviously a grid upgrade is needed. And for that purpose, for example, we provide a tool uh, which is called automated grid reinforcement um, that you can then um, start. We are then in the background now the platform is identifying suitable grid upgrades that can take care of this problem now in the grid of this line that has a, um, a, a high utilization. And then again here, you can see the notification that reinforced variant was created when I move back here to the same view you will see here the second alternative for the grid integration no marked in green you will see here uh, that no technical limits are, are violated in this case so you could select this variant go for the next step you would get an overview of the entire process again with the most relevant process data um, that is needed um, for an evaluation, and then basically you would um, be finished. And yeah, um, the, the key idea then of the intelligent grid platform is to accelerate and streamline this process. I've mentioned before that in today's processes, you would find typical process times of, let's say, one hour, two hours by average. And with our platform, grid planner can do that in a couple of, uh, of minutes. But that would be then. Uh, just just one um, one use case that we are offering within our platform. Um, the other use case that we are supporting is then more targeted um, towards the future grid planning. So uh, imagine the scenario that also Chris and Sung pointed out of a um, strong increase of um, electric vehicles uh, and more infrastructure or charging infrastructure that is needed in the grid. And for this future grid planning, we provide an application which is called Grid Study with the main goal of creating a future scenario for the supply task. So for, ex for example, with an increased adoption rate of EV, EV chargers, and then the possibility to evaluate the impact on the grid. And I would quickly guide you through the different uh, steps so that you have a feeling of what can be done by the user, for example, you can add new grid participants as part of a grid study. You can pick from a range of different load and, and, and generator types. So in, in our case, it could be a private uh, charging station. Then you can select the area that should be considered in this kind of grid study. Uh, so either you can choose it here on the map or you can choose it by grid name or by coordinate list. So for example, you could just pick all the low voltage grids, and then you can specify how many charging stations should be added. So, and, and also the respective power. So you could go for again, 11 kilowatts. You can select a penetration rate of, I don't know, maybe 30, 30 percent um, uh, of all the connection object nodes. And then you could save that as one part of this grid study. And then you could add additional information like larger, uh, charging station uh, stations also public 
charging stations and so on. And this is basically the way to create these um, studies in, in the front end. But in the back end, we can also be very flexible about well, how these grid studies are parametrized. Um, and for example, what you could also think of is uh, using all the information that Intertrust is providing in their platform about well, garages, for example, in their respective locations, about EV adoption rates in certain areas uh, of a city, and use all that data to create a future scenario for the supply task and feed that into our platform. So that's also a pretty nice feature. We can then yeah, benefit from the different kinds of data and the value of this, this information. Um, however, when you're finished with the grid study, you can move forward, you can specify a name, and uh, also specify what kind of analyses should be performed. However, uh, again, due, due to the limited time, I would skip that part and jump into a uh, test study that I also created before the webinar and also guide you directly to the results uh, where you can see then all the affected grids here in this table. You can see the impact of all the newly added um, elements on the voltage, uh, on the line utilization, you can see here different evaluations with scatter plots, for instance, where you can then uh, have a look at well, what's the impact on, on the different grids. Um, and you can also jump here into a more detailed analysis, uh, again, of the, of the results, where you will then basically land at the same view as I have shown before. So one particular grid, where you can then see uh, the impact on the line utilization, on the voltages in the grid and so on and yeah um, investigate well what's the remaining grid capacity is, is grid reinforcement needed and so on and um, so on and um, yeah that's basically the key idea of our platform i hope i could guide you through uh, some of the use cases and with that also my presentation um, would be finished and with that i would give it back to intertrust Thank you so much, uh, everybody. I think both of the demonstrations were very uh, insightful. Um, given that we are almost running out of time, let's go through some questions quickly. We've got a few questions posted here. Um, the first one is for the Intertrust platform. Um, it reads, I understand that power blackouts are a common problem in the summer, primarily due to fires, increased air conditioning use, et cetera. Will the Intertrust platform be able to help the city and state mitigate or manage the infrastructure in the near term, both for EV use as well as for electricity availability in general? Yeah, I could I could take that uh, the question. Uh, yeah, basically we we didn't demonstrate this in today's session, but we also have a solution that that's built on top of the platform, uh, which we call the demand demand. Uh, response uh, charger demand response uh, and so basically what the concept there is we work closely with the utilities and um, connect them with the actual charge point operators um, so whenever there is a high load in the region or potentially a, a outage of energy we could ask uh, request the, the utilities could request these uh, charge point operators to reduce the consumption of power and so this is real time this is utilizing open adr uh, so, and this is in production in Europe. Uh, and so basically whenever um, uh, the, the utilities has any um, potential issues in the future or even, even in real time, they could create these restrictions and then in, immediately we get the, this information gets sent out to the actual charge point operators and then they can uh, decide whether to opt in or opt out in those scenarios. Uh, but that will allow them to control all of their devices and whenever there is a high risk where there's a, a high load in certain areas they can uh, uh, the utilities can send that request out and then the the uh, charge point operators can reduce the consumption at those locations mm -hmm. yeah i just want to yeah i want to add one more thing sorry Pratik, uh to that because i think the disaster recovery use case is also very interesting because that is again it's a multi-party uh, data problem where you may have um, different crews responding, you need to coordinate, uh, create a common operating picture for a number of first responders and communicate that information. And with the platform, that's really one of the key um, features that we want to provide. So if that data 
is available, you can then uh, publish that data where people can discover it, incorporate it into these types of tools, um, or even develop a more of a real-time common operating picture type of dashboard. We've done that within the renewables space, uh, unifying a lot of different real-time data, um, more for an operations and maintenance use case, but at the same time, it is a operational dashboard. So being able to communicate that information to different technicians in the field, first responders, et cetera, um, that, that's really requires having that data available and being able to very quickly respond. So that's that's one of, I think it's a great use case uh, for the InterTrust platform in general. So talking about that, uh, there's another question here, um, you know, you've got your access to data and you're trying to collaborate with different third parties. Uh, the governance piece becomes an important, uh, you know, part of the puzzle. The question here is, can you elaborate a little bit more on the data governance piece who defines the rules? Are there any preset rules and functions we can use? Yeah, so one of the founding principles for the platform is that data owners should have control over the governance of their data. So as someone who would contribute data or publish data onto the InterTrust platform, we allow those data owners to define the privileges and potential restrictions around what types of data uh, would be accessible by data consumers. And so that includes very fine grained row or column level access control um, within a table, for example, you can define data sets that are fit for purpose. So even if you have data that may reside in a relational database in Azure and maybe some CSV files that reside on Amazon, what we can do with the data virtualization capability within the platform is actually allow data stewards or someone who's managing or curating that data to join that and create a data set that looks like a single object where actually underneath it may be pulling data from different physical locations, different underlying databases, and then expose that data. So you might think of a use case where you have customer data that's stored in a relational database, and maybe you have some transactional database data that's stored more in a uh, in a object store, for example, or even the time series database in in um, the platform, uh, you can join those bits of data. You don't you don't have to expose both sets of data. You can actually join them, expose one object, and then determine what type of access uh, consumers have. So you can choose to obfuscate certain columns. Maybe you don't want to expose certain personally identifiable information. Um, all of that's possible with the InterTrust platform. Got it. Thanks, Chris. Um, Tobias, uh, there's a question for you. Um, actually, there are two questions that I try and combine into one. Um, as we think of digitizing our processes, is there some kind of a test environment that can help identify issues and gaps before we deploy the full solution? The second part also is like, does the intelligent grid platform allow any kind of simulation or circuit analysis? Um, yes, yeah, so data data quality is obviously crucial uh, also to the results, um, and this is actually with, within all our deployments uh, with different DSOs, basically the first step of the collaboration. So making sure that the grid model has a high quality, that there are no data gaps and also no data inconsistencies. That is something that is typically happening, uh, obviously, um, because we are talking about mass data, millions of data points. Um, but we provide a range of different algorithms also to, to support the grid operators in, in, in this field. So identifying obvious data gaps, identifying obvious data inconsistencies. And we also have a range of different algorithms uh, that can be used to fix uh, the most common problems. So for example, data gaps, um, switching topology, errors, obviously, uh, and so on and so on. So um, uh, there's another question here, and I, I guess, Chris, you'd be the best person for this. Um, if a grid study looks promising, does your platform help initiate the administrative process to license, plan, and execute? Or is that an app the companies would build themselves on top of the InterTrust platform? I would think that would be an, an application. Clean Grid currently doesn't support the actual sort of process approach because you know, different companies may have different workflows. This is something that we've seen. Um, so it may not be something that can be generalized, but it's definitely something that could be built on top of it. And I don't know, Sung, if you want to 
add anything from the solution standpoint. Um, but you, we could work with customers to do that. Um, it may be something that Invilio supports. Um, I don't know, so I can toss it over to Tobias as well. Um, but by default, you know, the platform is really orient. The platform itself, you can think about as a as a horizontal solution. Um, mm -hmm. Clean Grid, this toolkit can evolve to potentially include those types of use cases. Uh, but we'd probably work closely with the customer because I would suspect that the processes might differ and there may be different systems that need to be incorporated. Um, so it really depends on on the workflow for the specific customer. Yeah, and I'd like to add, um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at right now is trying to build out some sort of a data catalog where, you know, potentially customers can identify, you know, what data is out there and potentially work with the data owners. Um, now, we don't deal with the licensing aspect, but again, that's something that uh, you'd have to work with individually with, with the individual data owners. But at least we facilitate the ability for you to be able to uh, identify what data is out there and then potentially connect you with the right people to, to make that uh, connection to get access to that data. Got it. Um, as we are you know, getting closer to running out of time, um, there's one question that's probably applicable for both of these platforms we're talking about today. Um, how much time does it take to integrate um, one of these solutions? Um, I think Tobias, maybe you can take a first stab at it and Chris and Sun, you can go next. Yeah, so I think for, for our platform, so the Intelligent Grid platform, it would take roughly two to three months to integrate with the existing software tools at the, at the grid operator. So build the interfaces and so on. We would not start from scratch typically because we have templates for all kinds of different tools that are commonly used, ERP systems, GIS and so on. And after that, well, there typic there's typically some kind of data validation process uh, before a platform goes productive and, and goes live in all operative processes which can then take another couple of months. So that would be a time frame that is realistic from, from our perspective. Yeah, from the demonstration that I demonstrated that I did today, typically uh, it just depends on the availability of data. Um, if the data is already there and you know ready to go, then typically in a few weeks, we could get uh, the system up and running, integrate with your data. Um, the integration part is easy, it's more of uh, massaging the data there might be some tweaks that you have to do with data to uh, make it work with the system. But if, it's, if it works with GIS systems, it's pretty much plug and play from our perspective. Um, it's more of a deployment and setup and, and identifying some of the use cases um, against the data sets that's available. Got it. Um, thanks, everybody. And uh, we are at the top of the hour. And uh, you know, there are a few more questions. We'd uh, be happy to respond over email. Um, Thanks everybody for uh, taking time to join us for the session.